<laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Were any of you along with the Moravec expedition? No. Did you film him? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, now, it's, now in your book, Society of Mind, you, you start off by saying, or in the first page, a century ago, we had no way to explain the human mind. Now, it's interesting to me, and one of the things I want our viewers to understand, that a machine which came into the world, sort of around the 1950s, why should a machine, a computer, be any help in, in, in this? Why did it form the basis, the focus of a, of a new intellectual movement, artificial intelligence? The development of computer science produced a new kind of thinking, a new style of explanation for which there was really no precedent. And the idea was, how do you describe a process? Uh, for example, mathematics is good at describing things. Geometry, it's good at describing curves, and, and uh, it's good at describing mechanics, uh, like uh, the differential equation for a solar system but it's not good for describing even a simple machine uh, whose behavior depends on things that happen as they come in. Mathematical, the mathematical world is, uh, to me, sort of frozen. But once we had the idea of a computer, we could start saying, how can I make something that learns? How can I make something that adapts to its environment? How can I make something that stores responses to a million different situations and uh, changes and adapts. And there wasn't any way to think about this before 1950, uh, in our own lifetime. So all of philosophy, to me, is simply bad psychology, because the philosophers are struggling with the idea of trying to describe these complicated processes that we're made of in terms of simple things like logic and geometry, static, uh, low-level, crude, coarse, vulgar descriptions compared to the subtlety of any process that has a million parts and a, a million bits of memory and responds to a million different conditions in different ways. There just was no science of such a thing before and 1950. presumably so little was known about the, the structure and workings of the brain that that didn't offer a, a, a root either. Even to this day, uh, no one knows how the nerve cells in the central nervous system work very well. There are a few theories, but I think uh, any sensible person would agree that uh, there's only a small chance that the first few theories uh, are right. And so most of what we think we know about the human brain today is by analogy with what we really know from the computers. Now, one thing some people have difficulty with is this idea that you could study something like the workings of the human mind on a machine which didn't resemble in any way the, the architecture or of the brain. What was the logic? What was the argument behind this? I think there are some very different views of the same thing uh, circulating today because uh, some people say the brain is a biological thing. It's very different from a computer. It's soft. Computers are hard. Uh, it's cold. Uh, people are warm. Uh, the shapes of the cells are variable and uh, curved, whereas the shapes of machines are square. But this is missing the point, I think. The brain is different from the rest of biology in a very important way, because in most of biology there are a lot of interactions and, and things are rather complicated. What was discovered around 1990, it's, it's only a century old, is that each brain cell is more or less separate from the others. It's a separate machine. It's certainly in a bath of chemicals, but those chemicals are very carefully controlled. And so uh, when certain conditions occur around the periphery of a nerve cell, then it suddenly goes bang, and that's absolute. It's very simple and clean, just like the parts in a computer. The signal flows along the fiber, goes to the end, makes some conditions for another neuron. So you might say that the cells of the nervous system are the closest thing in the universe to the transistors and gates of a computer. Uh, so I find it very funny that some people will say, oh, it's so different. And then they mention all the superficial features. And they miss the important feature, which is that unlike the liver and the heart and all the other parts of the body which are sort of continuous and analog, it's the nerve cells which 
are digital, they're on or off, certainly they're very complicated digital devices, and they're the thing in the universe closest to computers. So it's funny to emphasize the difference instead of the similarity. But there is also the argument that the processes themselves can be studied in a, independently of any implementation. Isn't there? That was an argument. Well, one of the problems with the brain, and the reason why today in 1990 we still don't know how a cortical granule cell works. Most of the brain is cortex. It uh, has believed to have 100 billion or more cells. And what we know about the cells of the brain, we get from our knowledge about the crayfish and the sea anemone because they stay alive for days in cool water, whereas uh, you know that uh, mammalian brains die in five or 10 minutes if they're disconnected. And so uh, it seems to me that the idea that you can't study a brain the way you could study a typewriter or an electric circuit, uh, it's very hard to study it because it's so delicate but that's not a matter of principle, that's a matter of bad luck. If the brain were a thousand times larger, you could crawl around and attach clip leads and study it just like any other machine. And so the general belief has grown that there's something different about it. And again, people are confusing essentials with accidents. There's a reason why, brain, why your brain cell is a million times smaller than you, or a billion times, because in order to be intelligent, you have to have a billion brain cells, so you have to be a billion times larger. Uh, so I think all animals in the universe, wherever they may be, will have a little trouble at first understanding their own brains because you need so many cells to be. But uh, we're developing instruments, and I think another 10 or 20 years we'll be able to uh, connect things to brain cells and find out just how they work, and it won't be so hard after that. What would the... Could you just hang for a sure. second? Could you just walk your leg around just a little bit more? Yep. <laughs> What sort of things did the early AI pioneers try to do, and what was this idea of search that uh, maybe tell me a bit about? Maybe the first important idea about how machines could be smart was to notice that machines were tireless and they were becoming fast. And so if you had a certain kind of problem, uh, which might be hard for a person, uh, it would be easy for a computer to solve it if the computer could simply try every possibility. Now, only certain problems are small enough uh, for this to happen, but uh, I remember once there was a wonderful puzzle. It's called pentominoes. Uh, I should have a picture of it, but anyway, uh, it's a, a rectangle, which I think is uh, 6 by 12 or 8 by 12 of little squares, like a most of a checkerboard, and there are a bunch of little pieces, each of which are made of five squares. There's five in a row, and there's a sort of uh, corner-shaped one, one, two, three, four, five, and an L, and a zigzag like a W. I think there are 12 different pentominoes that you can make, and it's a wonderful puzzle for somebody to put all of these pieces into one rectangle. People find it very hard. They fuss around. Some people fuss for an hour, can't do it. Uh, well, uh, we once, uh, Stuart Nelson, who's one of the hackers here, one said, well, that's easy. He wrote a little computer program that tried all possibilities, and it generated uh, all million solutions in a couple of minutes. So there's an example where the computer wasn't very smart. But it could simply try, after I put this piece in, there are eight ways to put the next one, and six ways to put the next one, and five ways. And it just uh, did all those possible ways. So if you have a small enough problem and a way to tell when it's solved, then you can use what we called exhaustive search. And, uh and many of the early problems, did they fall into that category? So uh, yes, and now a few problems fell into that category and worked very well. Uh, but uh, one of the things we wanted to do was get a machine to play chess and checkers because uh, people liked those games. And it turned out for those games, there's too many possibilities because I make a move in chess, there are about 30 things you can do typically, and then the other person can make about 30 replies. And, so in two layers, that's 30 times 30, it's about 1,000. In four layers, it's a million. In six layers, uh, you're up to a billion possibilities. And uh, a computer today could do a billion chess moves in, in a minute or two, but in those days, it would take weeks or more. So you're sort of getting a tree. Each limb has 30 branches, and each branch has 30 twigs, and each twig has that sort of thing. 
and so you have to prune the tree. So a lot of AI research in the 1950s was finding wonderful new ideas about how to reduce these search trees so that you could solve harder problems in the same time. And I'd say there was 10 years of progressive and interesting discoveries about that. Now some of these um, uh, projects had uh, really quite spectacular success and they presented this paradox that these were among many of the things which human, most human beings considered very difficult to do. You mentioned uh, previously Slagle's program, was that a good example? A wonderful example uh, was, and I think he was my second graduate student, Manuel Bloom was the first, uh, Jim Slagle uh, decided to write a program which would try to solve the kinds of problems that uh, MIT students do in the first year calculus mathematics. And the problem was doing what we call symbolic integrals. And he wrote a program which consisted of more or less a hundred kinds of rules or suggestions. Let's say if you see 1 minus x squared in a math problem, the mathematicians know it's very tempting to say x equals a sine y or some trigonometric thing. The reason has to do with the fact that in a circle uh, the equation is x squared plus y squared equals 1. It's very uh, familiar to mathematicians, very alien to everyone else. But anyway, Slagle wrote down about 20 rules of thumb, uh, suggestions for how to solve a calculus problem, another 20 or 30 rules for how to do high school algebra, because you can't do calculus without algebra, and then a profound set of another a uh, dozen or so uh, suggestions about how to tell when a problem's getting too hard and you should try another one. Well, you see, in calculus, to solve one of these things, there are many things you can try. It's just like chess. You could try moving this pawn or that knight. And in calculus, you could try using a logarithm here or a trigonometric or a sine or a cosine or, or just multiplying or dividing. And there are all sorts of alternatives to when you're doing the algebra. So he wrote down these about 100 rules altogether, you would tr the machine would try various ones, and then uh, it would use the special set of rules. I called them rules of fear. If, if the thing got too complicated, it would say, that's no good. It's too complicated. But if it seemed to be getting simpler, it would follow it further. Well, the amazing thing, and this was 1960, just uh, a couple of years after we started, uh, the thing got an A on the MIT exam, and it was frightening. Uh, it was doing as well as the average student, or maybe slightly better. Uh, couldn't do some problems, could do others, and the kinds of problems it solved were pretty much like the kind the students did. So then a few years later, you had one which dealt with high school algebra, didn't you, student, which was a more difficult problem. You... Well, of course, uh, th this calculus problem is a very purely formal problem. It's, it's all in equations and mathematical expressions. And although those are frightening to some people, uh, they're simpler than words. Uh, Danny Barbro in 1964 started a program uh, to do the same sort of algebra except that it would be word problems. Problems like uh, uh, John is twice as old as Mary was when she was the same age as, you know, those. Uh, those are things that high school students find very difficult actually. Although the algebra is terribly easy. But the problem is that the words have too many meanings and if you look at mathematical symbols in algebra, maybe it's like a language with only 20 words, plus, minus, uh, x squared, such a sm equal, such a small vocabulary in pure mathematics, but in the vocabulary of ordinary language, uh, 10,000 uh, for a normal person, 100,000 for a, uh, a very articulate person. And so the kinds of things that every little child learns to do, like talk with uh, 10,000 words, is much, much harder, we found, to our surprise, than solving the kinds of things that a PhD mathemati mathematician would do uh, in a world of expertise. And this went on for 20 years, from the middle 1950s to the middle 1970s. Uh, we found it was, became easier and easier to do, to get machines to do things that people admired as expertise, but it was very hard to creep downwards from the college level to the adolescent to the child to the infant. and see if we could get a machine to learn the kinds of things that everybody considers it's perfectly natural and simple and obvious. You, just one second. Okay. You said in one of your papers that, that actually AI showed a, a tendency to regress towards infancy, didn't you? It started out. 
Yes, it was a very strange field because it had this backwards regression. We started out uh, in the 1950s, uh, uh, Newell, Simon, and Shaw at, uh, in Pittsburgh uh, wrote a program that did very amusing things with mathematical logic, and uh, it proved theorems in mathematical logic. They were pretty hard. Uh, they did. They found a proof that was better than the best one that Russell and Whitehead found, and Bertrand Russell was sort of impressed. And uh, you know, the machines were starting to play chess and do calculus and that sort of thing. Everybody's very impressed because machines were doing hard things. But uh, what we began to see is that the things that people think are hard are actually rather easy, and the things that people think are easy are very hard. Uh, we could do the calculus with just a few hundred pieces of program, but to learn language, to recognize faces, to walk, and to put your clothes on and do the kinds of things we expect every child to do, we still can't do with the robots of, and the AIs of 1990. Let's look at some of those things that turned out to be hard and uh, try to understand why they're hard. Why should um, understanding language, understanding children's stories, why should that be a difficult task? Uh, there are several ways to explain this. Uh, a humorous way would be that it took animals, uh, took about three billion years for the first, to go from the first cells to the vertebrates, the fish and the amphibia and the reptiles and then 400 million years to go from the first animals to the chimpanzee. And then it's just 400 million years, you see, and then it's just four or five million years to go from the chimpanzee to man. So you might expect in that sense that the kinds of things that the chimpanzee or the child can do are very hard, and the difference between the chimp and the man, which is playing chess and doing calculus and uh, uh, things like that, difference between a kid and an adult, uh, would be relatively simple in a sense. First, you had to get the basic brain that's able to learn complicated things. The complicated things themselves are nothing. So that's one reason. I think the other th reason is that why was it easy to build these expert systems? And this is my own theory, that if you look at the expert systems out there today that do such good things like chess, each one is based on a certain way of representing the world. We call this representation of knowledge or model of the world or something. And these wonderful uh, high-powered programs each use one way of representing the world and one way of representing knowledge. But in language, uh, each thing we do uses, I suspect, three or four major different kinds of representations and maybe 20 or 30 minor ones. And so everything that an ordinary person does in ordinary life is a is, consists of maybe 20 different ways of proceeding and all their relations between them. That's much more complicated than the kind of precise, narrow thing that an expert does. For example, when I see a dog, I recognize it as a physical object, and part of my brain says, oh, that interesting thing weighs about four pounds, and it has this color and so forth. And another part uh, says, uh, it seems to want something, so I have an emotional, not emotional, but I have a social reaction to it in terms of uh, social communication and maybe uh, their defense mechanism. I have to treat this as a threatening situation. Is it going to bite? Uh, when you meet a person, you're discussing a particular topic, you're wondering how you're getting along with them, you're trying to cope with cultural differences. If I meet somebody, they say, where do you live? If they're a foreigner, I say, I live in Boston, or I live in the uh, east coast of the United States. If there's somebody uh, from this area, I say Brookline. But I know that strangers don't know where Brookline is. They might have heard of Cambridge. And so every time a word comes in, the way I react to it depends on many different other kinds of knowledge. And I don't think these problems are unsolvable at all. In fact, I, in the Society of Mind, I propose some theories of it. but. I feel that the research community working on artificial intelligence uh, got so addicted to its success with expert systems that almost everybody in the community is saying, if we just get exactly the right representation, we can solve all problems. And I think the reason why it's hard to get a machine to behave like a child is that it's not finding the right representation that's important at all. It's finding six or ten representations and discovering how to manage the relations between them. I don't think that's a very hard problem, but for some reason no one works on it. It's, it's outside the uh, scope of what people consider their job. Now, Rufus, we'll change sets.
Yeah. Yeah. The your your thoughts on the society of mind, which I've come to, that came out of the your, your work on blocks world, didn't it? I wonder. I mean, or, or many of the ideas were developed during that. I wonder if you could tell me how the blocks the blocks project started. And uh, can't remember. There's a story that's told. I don't know whether it's apocryphal, which says that it, this was a this was a con misconceived as a holiday project. Is that? Or not for There's a garbled Sussman. story about yeah. Jerry Sussman. Yeah. Is that true or not? Uh, no. What was true is that we had a vision project trying to get the machine to see these blocks and other things. And uh, it wasn't working very well. And there was a very smart freshman named Gerald Sussman. So I decided that uh, the reason the vision project wasn't working very well was that everybody must be on the wrong track. And so I put him in charge of it for one summer, and uh, because he had had many ideas of his own, and uh, I thought it might be a good chance to see if a beginner would do better. And he didn't do worse than the others. Uh, the legend changed into, uh, I've seen it written that Minsky put a graduate student in, in charge of the project, but that just shows how conservative people are. Uh, it was actually a freshman, and. He's now a professor. Uh, he's a rather good freshman. <laughs> Why was um, stacking blocks a very difficult problem? Well, we decided we wanted to make a machine that interacted with the real world. And uh, a nice way to do that would be to give it eyes and hands. And so uh, I decided we should try to get the computer to be able to see things. And when it sees something, it should be able to do something with it, pick it up. And that turned out to be uh, very complicated indeed, because uh, when you try to recognize an object, it's easy enough to get a picture into a computer. We made circuits that used things like television cameras, which were just beginning to be uh, usable. And the trouble is that a, a block or a box is different. You move it this way, it's a different shape. And so uh, you almost never see the same thing twice. Sometimes. Uh, there's shadows on it. Sometimes it's darker or lighter. Different boxes have different surfaces. Sometimes there are things written on it. So that even though uh, to you or me or a child the idea of a, seeing a block seems simple, it's actually very, very complicated. It's out of focus sometimes. Uh, if the light on two sides is just the same intensity, you cannot see the edge. So there are plenty of problems. And it turned out that uh, Somebody would write a computer program to locate a block, and it would work on three blocks out of 10 or five blocks out of 10. It just wouldn't find the others. Then another person would write another program to find blocks with a different idea, and it would work on different blocks. It wasn't that you could say each program got a score of 40% or 80% or something. Each different program would, see, would be better or worse at different jobs. And what I began to sense was that uh, we should stop looking for a very good vision program, and this concept came to uh, Pappert and me around the same time. We were working together. The idea was, all right, let's see if we could get 10 pretty good vision programs and get them uh, and manage them and see which of them seemed to be working in different situations. So the idea of the society of mind was that uh, in the brain or in the mind or in a computer, you shouldn't look for perfection, and you shouldn't go around trying to debug programs and find the best possible way to do something. You should find a lot of different ways and have different resources. And then you should make managers that can decide under which circumstances to use uh, which ones. Now, I still think this is the way to make big programs work better, but no one does it. And so uh, this idea, which is now from about the uh, late 1960s, and now it's the uh, early 1990s, uh, in spite of how simple and clearly correct this idea is, it hasn't caught on. And I'm very disappointed in my colleagues and people in the field of AI in general. For some reason, they've gotten fixed on the idea, let's get it right. And that's wrong. There is no right in the world. Right. I mean, there was some, um, just, just before we go on, there's one sense that you said before that it had been possible to capture the knowledge of an expert. How was it taking something like a child stacking blocks or listening to stories? What was different in the kind of things that they knew, children knew, as compared to experts? What was well, what happens 
in understanding a simple story. Uh, my friend Roger Shank at Yale, now at uh, Northwestern, had many of his students work on the problem of getting a machine to understand a simple children's story. We did that here and a few other places. And that's different from doing calculus or playing chess, because in chess there are a few rules. It's pretty clear what to do. It's very hard to know what to, how to play as well as a human, and nobody's figured it out yet, although the programs now play better than most humans, maybe uh, very much better. But they don't do it the same way, and they're still using a lot of search. But when you understand a story, you come across a word like boat. And what does boat mean? Uh, well, that's a bad word, but uh, when you look at it, you know so much. In calculus, if you see a, a sine function, you only need to have a few rules, at least to do calculus. But for a boat, you have to know uh, different kinds of boats for different kinds of water. They're kind Let's of... Try another word, because this is... Yeah, right. What about with a, a Abandon the damn What's thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, really a terrible word. Or I wonder whether another way of approaching this would be through the, uh, the story, the Charniak story. Or something. I think, uh, yeah. well, a very simple one in linguistics is, is uh, the word take. Uh, uh, John took a trip to Mexico. Very strange word. Sometimes take means to uh, obtain a physical object, to take it away from someone else. It's a social thing, uh, taking a trip. I don't know what that means. Take a look. Uh, you see, there are... If you look in the dictionary, you'll find 40 or 50 different entries. And so uh, here's a set of meanings, a set of processes to be applied to the rest of the words. And you have hundreds of them in your head because the ones in the dictionary uh, are just the families of these. You have to use the other clues to decide which of these hundreds of different mental procedures to apply to the rest of the words. And each of the words has the same thing. Well, what I'm saying is that to understand even a simple sentence, you have to know thousands of different things. And my example before is uh, to get an A in that part of uh, freshman calculus, you only have to know a hundred things. Now, I'm not saying that it passed the whole calculus course. I don't want to, uh, you know, oversell this thing. But it did a certain large part of it, the formal integration, and that's part that people considered expert. Well, to get it, understand a simple child story, you have to know so many hundreds and thousands of things, and they're different kinds of things. In a little child story, some word will talk about the geometric shape or the nature of space. Another one will talk about time. Uh, another thing will engage social relations and uh, a normal person's fear of the unknown or greed or acquisitiveness or territorial defense. And just to begin to talk to a four-year-old, you have to know all those things. So what I'm saying is, for a beginner to play chess, you have to know a hundred rules, and uh, if you do a little exhaustive search, you can uh, avoid the simplest disasters. To talk to a little child, maybe you have to know a hundred thousand things. So what I'm saying is these simple things, like understanding a little story, seems to me maybe a thousand times more complicated than at least beginning to approach uh, human competence in narrow expert domains. Now, um, most people, is it true to say, in, in artificial intelligence move to a consensus around a knowledge-based paradigm, even if they didn't go along with you and Paffet on Society of Mind? Well, most people in every field end up in a few clusters of establishment. Uh, I don't know the statistics, but I'd say half of the, certainly in the applied area, uh, a large proportion of people use rule-based expert systems. Um, in the world of research, a large number of people use uh, languages like Prolog, which uh, make it easy to work with rule-based systems. Uh, in the America, maybe most of the world, when it comes to representing knowledge, by far the majority of people, I think, uh, use something related to mathematical logic. Uh, the others use frames and scripts and rules. But uh, the most popular ways of doing things are always the ones that are the best established from 20 years before. So everyone agrees that sort of knowledge is the thing to represent. That's the key. But but you're saying everyone ag everyone agrees that uh, that you can't have an ignorant but brilliant machine be very good at solving problems, because in order to solve a problem, you'd better know something about the subject. Otherwise, you have to make all the evolutionary mistakes. But what they don't agree on is how to represent the knowledge, 
and I'm afraid that mostly they fight about which representation is best, and I feel that we have a dozen pretty good representations, and I wish there were a uh, hundred people working on the managers, because I'm pretty sure in the brain that things in the uh, visual cortex are represented one way, maybe by uh, sort of two-dimensional structures, and in the auditory cortex, there's two of them. Uh, this one maybe uses rule-based stuff. This one uh, uses something called semantic nets. Uh, other parts use frames and uh, uh, all the different representations that the researchers in artificial intelligence have developed. I don't know a, a one of the dozen or so popular representations that isn't better at something. And so I suspect that the brain has evolved uh, lots of knowledge representations. And the exciting problem is how to coordinate them. Now, the, 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 the problem which all these um, approaches were aimed at is, is this common sense knowledge problem, isn't it? What's, what's meant by common sense knowledge? Uh, I think uh, the, the expression common sense knowledge has a couple of flavors. They're almost contradictory. Uh, maybe the literal meaning is common sense knowledge is the knowledge that everybody shares. And you can trace that back, for example, to childhood. Every child uh, knows what a parent is, except one that doesn't. And we don't care much about exceptions here. So every child knows something about a family. And every child knows things about social relations, that if, if you hit somebody, they uh, make an expression uh, suggesting annoyance or pain. And if it's another child, it might fight with you. It's just so many thousands of little things. Everyone knows that if you hold something and release your grip, it falls. They don't know about gravity, but they know that this is common sense. There's no person uh, that you can communicate with who doesn't know the same things you do about space and time and social relations and uh, geometry and language and, and whatnot. Uh, how large is this database that we all share? I suspect it's about 10 million items or units, whatever units are, but nobody, you know, depends on your representation of knowledge. Now, there's another thing when we say common sense, common sense reasoning. It's as though there's a kind of thinking which is very simple and obvious, and everyone has it. And that's, a, I think, a bit of an illusion. The kinds of reasoning we find most simple are perhaps the most complicated and highly evolved ones in our brains. Okay, just, do you want to fix that? So what do you mean by common se an example of common sense knowledge? Hmm. Um, as opposed to, uh, common sense reasoning, sorry, as opposed to common sense knowledge. Boy. And is it important? I think an example of common sense reasoning is that if you see something move, then you say, well, either it's an animal and it moved for a reason of its own, or it's a physical object that's inanimate and it must have been pushed or uh, blown or something like that. So that uh, we all share kinds of reasoning. When we see something happen, we make explanations. And these, I think, are rather complicated and very uh, important, and nobody knows very much about them. Now, many of the, the, the <coughs> critics of artificial intelligence at, at this point, listening to your description of common sense knowledge and common sense reasoning might say, or did say, that these things came from growing up with a body and that the idea of a disembodied artificial intelligence was therefore in, in question because of this. I think that the, uh, there was some criticism that somehow uh, you couldn't separate the brain from the body and, and the world, but I never could understand what the critics who were talking about that had in mind, because of course, uh, if a machine has to learn something, it has to have some environment from which to learn it. And if a machine is going to uh, be competent in dealing with the physical world, then either it will need a body to experiment in the world, or else it will need a little uh, computer that simulates the kind of physics that you need for a world, like an airplane simulator. But there's one other thing that, the that, that those critics didn't understand, which is that if you could program into the machine the same knowledge that you would get by experience without learning, then it would understand it just as well as if it had learned it. And so there's a lot of confusion between the present state of a person. Uh, suppose that you have a normal person, they become paralyzed. Well, they still understand the world. They're not interacting with it. 
So it was nice to have a controllable body for learning through, but it's not philosophically or technically important, it's just convenient, and there are other ways uh, that it could learn. The brain actually, after all, isn't in the world, it's imprisoned in the skull in this dark, uh, moist, uh, quiet place, and it's only connected to the world by uh, video cables of a sort. The question I've asked some of these philosophers is if you had a, a, a baby that was born blind and paralyzed with one channel, auditory channel, so basically learned about the world through language, would such a person acquire be able to use language with common sense. What's your view? On that? Uh, it seems to me that the reason people are as smart as they are is that they have several ways of representing knowledge. If you have just a single way to represent knowledge, say as strings of words, the chances are that you might get stuck. Not be you try every th way you know of solving a problem. They don't work. There's nothing else to do. If you have a visual way to represent the world and an auditory way and a logical way and uh, a possessional way and a political way and so forth, then whenever you're trying to solve a problem and you get stuck, you can shift to another way. And so the more modalities, it's not that you have more senses, it's that each part of the brain connected to a sense organ has actually evolved a different kind of hardware. And so the person who's born deaf is a little bit handicapped because uh, they don't have access to a kind of uh, one way of dealing with the world. Uh, now, in fact, if they're well educated, uh, they may become better at solving most kinds of problems than uh, hearing people or sighted people because they can overcompensate. And uh, I believe every person has a dozen ways of representing knowledge. And if you're blind, you lose a couple of them. Uh, you've still got eight left. And, uh, but if you lose all but one, if you lost all but the sense of touch, uh, then you might might be very difficult. Uh, Helen Keller is a person who I think she got meningitis after she uh, and she had some memories of seeing and hearing and uh, it's much harder with babies who are uh, born with no senses at all. I don't know if there are any. Uh, there was an example we found of a, uh, Oliver Sacks has one of a, uh, a person born with um, blind with cerebral palsy and uh, who, virtually, who knew most of Blind what, and deaf? Not deaf, no. I mean, that's the thing, but, but still it's remarkable that most of what she knew about the world until she was 80 or something, she was read to her out of novels. So that was, uh, so still very restrictive. Mm -hmm. know, and she could talk normally. The but when you think about it, if you're reading a novel, then you're reading knowledge that has been processed by adults, and you're much better off than learning it yourself uh, through a baby's brain. Now, the Sight Project is an interesting example, which, um, I mean, the computer, that Doug Leonard's computer, is severely disabled in the sense you've been talking about, and he is having to give that knowledge to it, isn't he? Uh, well, the Sight machine is disabled in the most profound sense of all, which is that it doesn't learn. So it wouldn't matter if it could see or hear. Uh, it's basically a knowledge base that uh, is not able to acquire knowledge on its own. and. It's the first attempt to try to put in one machine many different kinds of knowledge. And I expect, uh, I would like to see 10 other such attempts around the world. Uh, it's a shame that we have all our eggs in one basket, and uh, Leonard and his group have uh, many wonderful ideas. Some of them might be badly wrong. He uh, thinks or hopes that his machine will be able to acquire knowledge when it knows something, because it's true to say, isn't it, that it's difficult to learn if you don't know anything to start. I think it's hard to learn if you don't know a lot of things and if you don't know how to learn. Uh, the trouble is that uh, no one in AI knows how to tell the machine much about how to learn because uh, there hasn't been a, really enough research on it. There are quite a number of, of early stage machine learning projects around the world, but I'm afraid they're a very small minority of the general investment in artificial intelligence. Compared to building practical, performing uh, expert systems, the, we really don't know very much about machine learning to this day. Now, learning's also changed, 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 yeah. You see, learning would seem to me to be like a basic thing. Why has, has it proved so intractable, or, or are you saying that just not very much good work has ever been done on learning? Yes, I'm not sure that learning is intractable, but the number of people who have tried to make machines learn is pretty small. So it hasn't been a high priority project. In order to learn, I suspect that 
you have to go through stages. That is, unless you have a certain set of concepts that, and processes for using them, it's very hard to understand the next step. It's, it's the way uh, Piaget, the great Swiss psychologist, described the development of children. He didn't have much of a theory of how they learn, actually, except maybe in the earliest stages of infancy, but he pointed out that before you can understand the idea of conservation of matter or energy or something like that, you already have to, or he thought, you had to have the idea of distinguishing between actions which are reversible and irreversible. For example, if I take a piece of clay, a ball of clay, and I flatten it out, it looks much bigger. But the older child knows that the flattening out process was reversible, and we can just roll it up again. And so uh, the child knows, well, if the operation is irreversible, then in some sense, the greater extent is not essential. It's, it's just a momentary feature. And gradually, the child accumulates a number of ideas which amount to that there's a certain quantity of substance. And what Piaget is saying is that you probably can't learn that concept in its full power, in all of its facets, until you've got these other ideas first. So there we're saying that you can't learn the law, idea of conservation until you know the idea of reversibility. Well, maybe there's another route, maybe there isn't. Nobody's thought of a plausible one. But it might be that even to learn very simple things that we take for granted, uh, for example, how do I learn that if I take an object and release my grasp, it goes down? I have to have the concept of down. I have to have the concept of, of intentionally releasing it as opposed to uh, something else. But I have to have the idea of, of support. In this case, support from the top. That's different from support from the bottom. It amounts to the same thing. So there's so many ideas you need before you could even look at the world and make explanations. And we have people working on what we call explanation-based learning. And uh, to me, that's one of the very most promising ideas in modern uh, AI research today, explanation-based learning. You look at a situation. You don't just describe the bits or the pixels of the picture. You describe the objects and their apparent relationships. But the relations come from you. It's not that there's a hand there and a piece of paper. It's that the hand is grasping the paper. That grasping is not there in the world, actually. It's something that comes from my own knowledge of the scene. So uh, maybe for psych or any knowledge-based program to learn, uh, it's going to be very slow or nearly impossible until we prime it with the with just the right sorts of concepts so it can start going rapidly. And I'll bet that a human infant is born with a surprisingly large collection of built-in procedures and mysterious pieces of hardware and, and reaction schemes that make it easy for the little uh, infant to learn. We just don't know what those are as yet. But would you say that that was the, the biggest problem to, to the solution of the common sense? Well, I suspect that once, uh, once you get a pretty a good system for learning, then there are a couple more stages. Maybe the child can then starts experimenting or the machine with variations on ways to learn. Because after all, uh, some people might take five examples of something before they say, well, maybe that's the general rule. And they're more impulsive people. They see something happen once and they say, oh, whenever there's a this, that'll happen. Uh, that People go so far, you call them superstitious. And so, uh, each person may tune things. And I think the greatest breakthrough of all will be when you get smart enough that you can invent new ways to learn and try them out and see which work. And then the thing can invent better ways to improve itself and so forth and just take off. And what uh, both Leonard and I and uh, many other people agree is there's some threshold. If you don't get up to that threshold, the machine just won't get better. Maybe it'll get worse if you let it learn. There was an example in 1957 uh, when Arthur Samuel uh, made a program that learned from experience to play checkers. And if it played with a good player, it got better and better. And if it played with a bad player, it got worse and worse. And uh, we don't want that. And But I suspect that once you get up to a certain threshold, you could say, my goodness, I've been learning from this experience and I'm getting worse. I'll turn it off. That's a very simple piece of knowledge. But if you don't have it, you might ruin yourself and uh, children who make bad friends. That's, we as parents, our greatest fear is what happens. It's, it's not our influence on the children. It's who are their real friends who are going to elevate them or ruin them because 
we know our children don't know how to learn to learn, they're going to copy it. Now, to raise connectionism, connectionists claim that networks can, can adapt, or, you know, and they use the term learning. Do you feel, and they might argue that it was an architectural problem, that actually um, it was difficult for us well, to raise symbolic uh, systems to, to learn? It's difficult for anything to learn something unless it's, uh, it's the right machine for it. Um, I, I built the first uh, neural network learning machine, in fact, uh, before I started to work on symbolic uh, approaches. And I got annoyed with the thing because uh, my particular machine learned very quickly at first and then it got slower and slower as it filled up. And uh, in order to make a new distinction, it would have to forget an old one. It was a rather small machine. Uh, and I got the feeling that uh, that it just didn't have enough organization to learn hard things. Now, the modern connectionists are, are in a very strange uh, level of science, I would say, right now, because you can see hundreds of papers. Somebody says, look, I got this machine to learn to pronounce words from spelling. Surely this is a very hard problem. Uh, some human programmer took a couple of years and to do this by hand, and his program is only a little better than mine, that sort of thing. Well, the trouble is we don't know how hard that program is in an absolute sense. If that human programmer uh, managed to write a program, I still don't know what it is he understood in doing that. And I don't understand what the neural net did. Uh, as far as I know, until they get some more science, uh, we just have to look at these anecdotes. People say, I got a neural net to do this, I got a neural net to do that. Uh, sometimes you hear somebody say, I'm trying to get it to do this, but I can't. Of course, people don't publish what it won't do. And so we don't learn much from this because they're just anecdotes. So uh, people are angry at me in that field because my feeling is, yes, if a neural net did that, it shows that probably the problem that it was solving was easier than they thought. And uh, they get very angry. But instead of getting angry, of course, what they should do is uh, come up with a theory to show me that that problem was in some technical sense hard. Uh, the trouble with the the field right now is that uh, there aren't good theories of classifying problems into levels of difficulty. In, in other parts of computer science, there's been some progress on that. There's a, what we call the theories of algorithmic complexity, but they're still not very good. And uh, so the progress of psychology in general, and particularly connectionism as a science, is going to depend on the invention of better mathematical theories of how difficult problems are. Just as in physics, physics couldn't progress until, even after Newton, until we had more theories of the characteristics of different kinds of differential equations. Otherwise, they'll just be random. Right, every now and then somebody will solve a problem, somebody will solve, not solve a problem. We won't know whether they were lucky or all the problems they're solving are easy or they are making really profound discoveries. So it's a little muddy until you get a theory. But most sciences uh, proceed 50 or 100 years with the experiments ahead of good, solid theory. So I'm not complaining that much. Now, when you began in um, 1956, your colleague uh, John McCarthy and you, um, since then, this, I want to introduce you to Society of Minds. Your, um, your views have diverged somewhat. Um, how would you just characterize the difference between? He, does he still believe you can get at these things through? logic? Or um, it's, it's rather tricky to describe just where we agree and disagree. Uh, we both agree very much and always have from the beginning that in order to, uh, for a machine to be smart, it would have to have common sense knowledge. Uh, where we differed, I think, was on how that common sense knowledge uh, would best be represented and on what are the reasoning processes that use it. Now, he's maintained that uh, it would be good to have a uniform uh, logical reasoning process. But in order to do that, you have to find ways of dealing with exceptions and uh, suppositions and things like that. And he's been working on technical subproblems of that sort for some 30 years. How do you make a logical system? Uh, how do you have an axiom and tolerate a few exceptions? Uh, how can you do reasoning of the form, what if this were not true for a moment, what could I learn from it? It's very difficult. And uh, my feeling is that uh, there are other ways to reason by analogy, using frames and defaults, 
that are more lifelike and more productive and that uh, you don't have to struggle quite so hard with these logical difficulties if you start with a more flexible system. In the long run, though, uh, it would be nice uh, if we were using these other uh, informal kinds of reasoning to have theorists come along and clean them up and say, well, in certain places we can replace it by a much more efficient, perfect procedure. I suspect that uh, most situations that can never be done, but uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, so we differ on what problems to work on. John likes to, McCarthy likes to prove things, get them settled. Uh, if you have a good theorem, it lasts a lifetime. If you have a practical theory, uh, you just never know what its status is from one year to the next. Now tell me, um, now you're saying that uh, you and Seymour Papert throughout the 60s and 70s <coughs> developed your ideas on, which led to your book, which you published this a few years ago, The Society of Minds. Um, tell me a bit about the theory of the Society of Minds. The Society of Mind theory is basically that in order to make a machine with the kind of versatility and resourcefulness that we take for granted in people, um, a good way to do that is to uh, package into that machine a lot of different ways to represent, no represent knowledge and a lot of different uh, ways to uh, exploit it. And this leads to a certain difficulty. Uh, is there a central place in this mechanical brain that's in charge of everything and knows everything? And I think uh, what I show in the book is that uh, that really can't be. Because if different kinds of knowledge are represented in different ways, then the parts of the brain, the parts of the machine that's doing all this, really can't communicate with each other very well. And so uh, you get a very different picture of identity. Uh, and I can't explain it briefly, but. Uh, it's a 300-page book, and in it I think I show all sorts of new ways to explain problems that have bothered uh, psychologists and philosophers for a long time, like uh, what does it mean for a machine to be conscious? And what I argue, uh, very much as Freud did, is that uh, this is not so difficult a problem as people think because the phenomenon of consciousness is overrated. Uh, people. If you talk to people, they act as though they know what they're thinking and they know what's out in the world and so forth. But in fact, uh, you don't know where you got the next sentence that you speak. I don't know where my words are coming from, what made me think of them. So that there's a little speech machine which has a little bit of memory of what it did a moment ago. And uh, I don't see any great difficulty in simulating that sort of thing in a computer. The hard part are the uh, maybe 400 different submachines that uh, are computing different aspects of how to solve various problems. There are lists of goals that I have and machines interpreting those goals. Maybe one of the goals is expressed verbally, but uh, it's talking about physical things. And there's a misunderstanding between this part of my mind and that part of my mind. And it's a big mess. Uh, well, I think that the only way to make sense of the weird phenomenon that uh, baffle psychologists and philosophers is to build a machine that works this way. And as far as I can see, judging by the failures of, for example, connectionist machines to learn to talk, there's a big difference between learning to understand a sentence and learning to pronounce a word, and logical machines learning to solve the simplest common sense problems and so forth. Uh, it seems to me the way to proceed is to find ways to do everything, build them all together, find ways to manage them, and then study what kind of phenomena you get when you assemble that machine. And my prediction is with a little uh, little work, you'll find the machine saying that it's conscious and denying that it's a machine and, uh, and having all sorts of beliefs of unscientific kind that uh, every normal common sense reasoning person uh, ends up with. So the mind is not one entity in this view? The it's mind a is not a centralized thing. It's a whole collection of different parts. And we see that in brain surgery. Uh, somebody has an accident, loses a piece of brain. There's still a person there. It's not the same person. It's missing some trait. It can't recognize faces. It can't think of the, we see injuries where a person can't think of the names of animals, peculiar kinds of aphasias and anomias and so forth. Uh, and if these are small injuries, this apparent person still functions. It's somewhat like the original person. It's missing some things. Uh, sometimes it adapts and rebuilds and finds substitutes. But uh, to me, the, uh, a person is not a person in the 
normal sense. A person is a wonderful package of interrelated traits and ideologies and things it's learned and pieces of hardware. And uh, it's a wonderful concept, even if realistic. Is the computer still a vital element of this type of research? I mean, can you make these things as small individual, lots of software machines? Can you simulate the whole thing? Or has it changed? Has hardware now become crucial? I guess I don't understand. Good <laughs> question. Um, uh -huh. uh, that if we have lots of types of machines in, in, in our mind, you know, um, hmm. can we can we represent them as, as pieces of software and simulate them? Is the computer? Oh yeah, uh, computers are now getting so fast. Uh, uh, pretty soon, you'll be able to buy a little box that uh, computes at a rate of a hundred million operations a second, and uh, by the year. 2000 or 2010, uh, it'll be doing uh, 10 billion operations a second in a desktop machine. By that time, I wouldn't be surprised if that's enough hardware that you could make everything a human brain does or simulate everything a human brain does in some sort of software. Maybe it'll be 10 or 20 years after that, maybe sooner. It's From the view of history, 10 or 20 years is, is a blink in in. in uh, evolutionary time, so we shouldn't be uh, worried about what what day it happens. But uh, surely, in a hundred years, there will be machines this big that have more capacity than the brain. Uh, Hans Moravec thinks it's uh, forty years. But some of these people, like Hans Moravec, uh, um, Rodney Brooks, believe that we have to sort of retrace evolution in a sense that we're going for too big a problem with the human brain. Do you? Oh, I think you should do what I'm doing, namely start with the most interesting aspects of uh, mental activity and try to figure out how they work and simulate parts of them. Uh, I think if you start by simulating the early stages of evolution, then uh, you'll spend a long time discovering the obvious. Um, but if, if you had uh, I, would, I would start, as Lenet does, with simple phenomena of natural language and work both ways. Take Take some level of performance which is meaningful and uh, easy to understand and respectable and work down to say how could it be learned and work up to say how could this turn into something like an adult. But uh, I wouldn't start at one extreme or the other. If you had uh, unlimited resources, how would you turn this into a research program? If I had unlimited resources, I would duplicate myself and just stay home and think. And after a long time, I'd come out and tell people what I concluded. I'm not serious. I get most of my ideas by arguing with people who don't agree and uh, then going home and working on the details. And then when I get stuck, coming out and arguing again. But I'm not interested in a big project because... Uh, but from what you've been saying, one way to approach this would be have lots and lots of people trying different approaches to it. Well, I'd like to have lots of people thinking about how to combine different approaches. It's not the different approaches themselves. It's why aren't there more people making a machine that uses three different representations of knowledge and crosses over? That's a very specific kind of research project, and I see no one doing it. So that's, to me, that's the missing link. Uh, this has been... Okay, okay change the tape, because I'm on my last set now. Yeah. I didn't see a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to me, foreign countries are places where the people can't talk right. I get no insight from it. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to be so much of a problem with some of these translating. You've, you've seen the Matsushita one, the telephone. No. Very impressive, yeah. What does it do? Japanese to English. I mean, limited vocabulary. It's, it's, it's tied in with um, I the space project. I haven't seen it. Did, it, it I can't speak Japanese, so I don't... But it'd be very useful. It's good enough to sort of phone up and say, um, you know... Uh, with continuous talk. speech? It's continuous. When did they demonstrate this? Uh, I've seen a film uh, that they made. It's Kaibi Carbonell, you know, at, uh, yeah. at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And it's in collaboration with Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. But we may see. This has been throughout a controversial field. I, I, I wanted to get some of your reflections on why you think, sort of, you know, looking at it, some people have, have, have been upset by AI, whether it's um, and what you think it's been about. I think the. The field is controversial because we live in a uh, spiritual, spiritualist culture. Uh, when Pasteur uh, argued that uh, living things were just chemistry, that was unacceptable. And because people said there's a real difference between things that are alive and things that are 
dead. You, in fact, you don't even apply the word dead to rocks. They're not worthy of it, what do we say, alive and inanimate. And so in the 19th century, until Pasteur roughly, uh, this was considered to be a very important distinction. Uh, now, in science, there's no distinction at all. Nobody considers living things to be any different from uh, other things, except that it happens to have certain processes going on. Well, I think the same thing is uh, people think that we live from a tradition from Plato on, which is that there's a mental world, it's a, a spiritual world, that, that p the body is a mechanical thing and the mind, or even the soul, is something else. And so AI is challenging that. In a religious culture, uh, we would be heretics to be burned or, or whatever, because, uh, but I don't see that it has anything to do with artificial intelligence. It's that to, uh, to most people in our culture, uh, we're saying there are no souls, there are no spirits. Uh, and so this is a religious controversy, not a technical one. No technical person, to me, of any quality, thinks that there is such a thing as a living thing. There are just things that move around because they have myosin, and uh, the mechanisms are sort of understood pretty well. And uh, we understand that you can't have something that's half alive because it takes a lot of stuff to have this thing keep going and repairing itself and fueling it uh, because it's a rather uh, crummy structure anyway. It needs a lot of continual repairs all the time. So the living things certainly are identifiable and they're different from the other things, but there's nothing special about them. I think the same thing is uh, the case with mentality. That is, if you have enough knowledge and enough processes and enough add up other processes to keep it uh, in contact with what it's doing. Uh, then you get a mind, and uh, I don't see it as something to argue about. But if somebody thinks that we have a spirit and an inherent value which is different from the stuff we're made of, then of course it's a threat. But it's, it's a religious argument, not a technical one. But some people who wouldn't be religious might also... They don't know they're religious. They don't know they're religious. I, see, I, I wonder whether it was a, a, a uniqueness of... Religious is... Thing, you know. To me, religious is the superstitious belief in spirits that don't exist. And so anyone who says there's something in a man that's not in a machine is religious in the sense that they're saying there's a spiritual quality I can't explain. No matter what you say, I refuse to believe that I don't have it. That's faith. That's not. They're not saying anything that it does that, uh, that technically uh, they can show we can't do. Or There's another interesting passage about, about what's happened in AI. It seems to me that whenever you've done something, um, the, the, the problem's been redefined. So, because clearly, still today, people f would think, you take a program like Mathematica, it's, I mean, I study physics at university, it can do pretty well all the maths I ever did, mm -hmm. and so forth. So clearly that's clever. But there's a way people say, well, that's just mathematics, um, what's really difficult, and so forth. Well, it's nice you gave that example, because Slagle was the first program to do formal integration. Then Joel Moses, uh, four years later, wrote another one, which was somewhat better than he and uh, Carl Engelman, Bill Martin, a number of people worked on it. Then Bobby Cavanis and uh, Robert Risch uh, came in. They added more mathematics. It got better. Now it's better than any mathematician in the world. And so now that it's that good, it's not considered experimental or controversial. So it's out of AI. And typically, as the machine gets better and better at something, it gets its own identity. Has that been a hard thing to take? I mean, you know, that, 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 um, that, that, that the successes get shunted out of AI? It depends on uh, what you're looking for. In a funny way, uh, in physics, uh, for example, that's a game for young people. Because it's very hard. The new theory of physics comes in, it, it's more complicated, it wipes out the old one, maybe it's simpler, it's hard to keep up. Uh, in AI, people are, are so, it's so controversial that it's still easy for me at my age to make up new theories. I, uh, so in a kind of selfish, personal way, it's very enjoyable that there's this hostility. Uh, there's still only a handful of us and all these wonderful problems. It's, it's like having all the children's blocks you want and the other kids don't come and take them away from you. But I think it's too bad that uh, more people don't understand how much more we could do if people would... Uh, uh, sort of try new ways and uh, cooperate and try to combine these methods instead of always arguing, I want the best one, my method is better than yours. So.
just winding up, a couple, what has surprised you most about the development of A, of computers, and B, of artificial intelligence, when you think back to the 1950s? I think it was a bit of a big surprise that the, the uh, things children do were so much, the things that seem hard are easy, and the things that are easy seem hard. Uh, other than that, it's hard to dissect that because I never tended to think in terms of how long things would take or how hard they were. It was more saying, if it's easy, then I don't want to bother with. If it's too hard, I don't want to work on it now. And uh, Did you imagine that computers would become as ubiquitous as they? I don't know if I imagined when. Uh, I think everyone was surprised uh, when the machines got uh, twice as fast in memory uh, got twice as cheap so rapidly, but when I was a little kid, I read H.G. Wells and E.E. Uh, e. Smith and Isaac Asimov. It was a uh, great pleasure meeting him and keeping up with him now, because how often do you get to meet your gods? And so uh, I read science fiction more than anything else. I don't read ordinary literature at all. I read some technical things, and I read science fiction novels, and nothing surprises me except uh, why doesn't everybody see that this is the right thing and work on it? It's, it's How so, has science fiction been at treating? I mean, well, science fiction is like any field; most of it's bad, but it's full of uh, uh, a dozen people who I think are the great philosophers of our time: uh, Asimov and Fred Pohl and Arthur Clarke, and now Greg Benford and David Brin. And uh, uh, now that I started, I feel Werner Vinge. I feel everyone I don't mention, Harry Harrison, is being left out. Uh, but uh, these are the great writers, but the publishers have got them in this niche. Uh, but when I see Norman Mailer or, or someone like that, that's trash. Why, he's no better than Aristophanes. He's writing again about the human condition and people screwing each other and people betraying and being attracted and infatuated. It's the same old stuff. Uh, but in science fiction, people say, what if something were actually different? And general literature is, what if things were the same again? It's too boring. You mentioned Asimov, but were you a bit disappointed that robotics proved to be so, so complicated? And so well, he didn't say when. You know, uh, it predated computers, really, didn't it, in Asimov? The, the machine he talked about. Oh, Robert. Re yeah. I was so entranced by Robert Heinlein's book in 1940 about remote manipulators, and we still don't have those in any quality. So some things are unaccountably slow. I tried for years to get people to build robots with five fingers, just like hands. They said, no, it's too hard. After a long time, they started making ones with three fingers and then four. Why don't they just bite the bullet? Because I want a five-fingered one so I can slip into the glove and get an output. And I don't understand people. It's only 20% more than four fingers. It's not as though it were twice as hard. Final question. I, I want to get some idea. I'm asking people this. How, how do you think, if, if the guess, future historians will rate the computer as an invention? It's obviously got ramifications in so many areas of life. How, how would you rate it? I'd say there were dark ages and then the Enlightenment. And it came in 1950 rather than 1350. They'll just move the transition. So the computer is the... The computer is when people started understanding processes instead of just static things. And so philosophically, that was a great difference. Before 1950, there was no way to describe something that was changing. So it brought an enlightenment in? A new way of thinking, that there were procedures. And that in computer science, you make a procedure. You say, here's the procedure. It's on this disk, this little package. I'm going to take this procedure and that one and put them together, and I'm going to attach this one here on the side. So that what happened in 1950 was that we could think of processes with the same mental equipment that we could think of things before. I can, everybody has known for 10,000 years that you can build something higher by stacking one thing on top of another. Now we know about subroutines and recursions and tail recursions and uh, there's a hundred words that the average person doesn't know, which are just important as the old word like beside and on top of. So most people don't know that what happened in 1950, that man, for the first time, learned to talk. We didn't have, everybody says, well, we learned speech sometime 30,000 years ago. Nobody knows when. But what I'm saying is a 1,000 years from now, 
It'll be 1950 when, when this animal learned to talk. The stuff before was just emotional utterances because it couldn't describe processes. It could just describe, oh, there's a thing there. And curiously, most people, as you say, 1950s, didn't see this dimension particularly. They saw this thing as an arithmetic. Computer idea. scientists were the worst of our enemies. It was the computer scientists who were telling the public it can only add fast. I had so many friends, artists, and I'd tell them, we're going to be able to do this. And they say, how will it work? And I would tell my scientists and say, it'll do this. They said, bullshit. It's just a fast adding machine. Can't do any of those things. So sort of cute irony. People who know too much, but not enough. And just in layman's terms then, I mean, the conception you came into the field, what is a computer? I mean, why, you know, just in... See, I had a great advantage, because when I came into the field, I, I was a little college student, I, I meet Warren McCulloch and John von Neumann and uh, these people, different world, they were called cybernetics. And I was just very fortunate. I landed in this, these are the people who, century from now, will be the philosophers of our time. How many people know the name Warren McCulloch, the greatest philosopher of the 20th century? He's unknown. But that's my prediction. A hundred years from now, they'll say those people were so lucky to have known Warren. And those are the people who set you on. Right, and those are the people who are thinking of processing processes as stuff. And so uh, when I sort of appeared as a child, I got into that culture, the Macy Conference, cybernetics, inner circle. Never fell out of it again.